Hey there, folks, and welcome to another edition of Israel Explained. I am your host, Shael Ben Ephraim, and let's get down to business. So, uh, first, I want to address the uh, rumors circulating about um, heavy casualties for the IDF forces tonight. Um, we're hearing a lot of rumors. I won't get into the details because nothing's confirmed, but it appears that uh, there have been some um, pretty serious casualties tonight in Gaza for the IDF. Um, and let's pray that uh, as many boys as possible return safely to Israel. Um, but today's topic is not about that. Maybe we'll talk about that tomorrow. Today we're going to be talking about the offer um, for Saudi normalization that uh, the United States and Saudi Arabia are currently bandying about. Um, as you might remember, before the war, there was a move to normalize relations between Saudi Arabia and Israel. Um, and some people even believe that this uh, attack by Hamas on October 7th was launched in order to torpedo that. That may have been one of the considerations, um, probably not the, the main consideration. And it appeared for a while that that move was dead. But um, the United States and Saudi Arabia, in an attempt to sort of um, lure Israel onto what they see as the path of righteousness, the path to a two-state solution, have revived it and put it as part of a sort of carrot and stick package to try to get Israel interested in pursuing the uh, two-state solution deal that they both want to put forth. Uh, on Tuesday... In Davos, both the United States and Saudi Arabia talked about this publicly after having um, aired it privately with Israel in conversations over the two weeks prior. Prince Faisal bin Farhan, who's the foreign minister of Saudi Arabia, said that the country would certainly be prepared to normalize relations with Israel if Israel and the Palestinians concluded a settlement that ended with a Palestinian state. Uh, he made sure to add caveats uh, in a CNN interview on Sunday, uh, yesterday, when he was asked if a credible and irreversible path to a Palestinian state would be necessary for the normalization of relations between Saudi Arabia and Israel. And he replied, that's the only way we're going to get a benefit. So yes, so it has to be a credible and irreversible path to a Palestinian state. Uh, Blinken at Davos, uh, Secretary of State Anthony Blinken, said, quote, if you take a regional approach and if you pursue integration with security with a Palestinian state, all of a sudden you have a region that's come together in ways that answer the most profound questions that Israel has been trying to answer for years. So what is this uh, plan with the answer to all these profound questions that Blinken is telling us about? Um, it's very much a rough outline. Um, according to what Thomas Friedman wrote in his column, and of course we know Thomas Friedman, who is not exactly the best analyst of the Middle East, the advantage to his columns is that he's very close to the White House when the Democrats are in charge. So he's very close to Obama, and now he's very close to Biden. So he's when he brings a plan, it's what uh, the Americans always want to be made public from their plan. So this is what he says. He says, quote, um, there'll be two phases. The first phase will involve the following. A ceasefire in Gaza that would bring about a return of the hostages. A release of the heavy terrorists by Israel. Allowing for the emergence of local Palestinian bureaucracy rule in the interim. And the possible deportation of Hamas leadership. So the, that's the first stage. All that is more or less in tune with what Israel has said that it's willing to do, which is probably not a coincidence. Phase two is where paths start to really diverge, right? Um, in phase two, the PLO will name a transitional governing authority. Um, the Western states and Arab states will begin to build proper institutions, including a security force for Gaza, the West Bank. Then Saudi Arabia will begin a process of normalization, but it will only reach fruition when a two-state solution is reached. So it's a deepening process of normalization that will only end in full normalization, um, which I assume would mean embassies, etc., once a Palestinian state exists. 
Netanyahu gave a speech that absolutely and completely rejected it. So that speech that he gave was in response to this plan. And in that speech, he said, there'll be no Palestinian state. Israel will retain complete security control in all territory west of the Jordan River. By the way, not from the river to the sea, as it was reported in Western media, but all territory west of the Jordan River. And saying you have security control from the Jordan River uh, westward is a traditional Israeli way of talking about security from the days of Igal Alon and Moshe Dayan to today. So it's not a uh, um, from the river to the sea moment. Uh, and he said that that is a vital condition that Israel retains security authority. Of course, technically, it doesn't have complete security authority in the West Bank right now, although it seems that way most of the time. And what he's saying here is that in Gaza, he doesn't want to see any kind of security apparatus. Israel will be responsible for everything. So Netanyahu's rejection, I think, is a problem. And I'll talk about why. But it's not because the plan is so perfect. The plan has a lot of problems. Um, some of them might just be because it lacks detail, and you would have to fill in those details later on. But there are some clear problems nonetheless. For example, how does any non-Hamas government start working without Israel having eliminated Hamas? Netanyahu said as much in his speech. He said that officials would be afraid to act because they might get a, quote, bullet in the head, which is true. Um, also, will Hamas be allowed to run in elections? Will the Islamic Jihad be allowed to run in elections? How do you determine who runs and who doesn't run? And if you stop too many groups from running, is it democratic? These are a lot of things that need to, um, to be addressed. Um, but there are some major advantages to this plan, too. Ones that you can't just overlook if you're Israel. Most notably, creating a firm and open alliance against Iran one where Israel is an important pillar in security architecture. Um, essentially, if this deal were to succeed and you add it on top of the Abraham Accords, which I think were uh, a great success, you have the problem of Israeli legitimacy in the Middle East resolved to a great extent. You have its uh, presence in the Middle East recognized by most of the um, local actors, and you have most of the region on Israel's side against Iran. Uh, and keep in mind that the main problem that Israel is addressing in this war in Gaza isn't so much Gaza itself, as much as it being surrounded by Iranian proxies on side and fighting them. Um, the questions of Hezbollah and the Houthi rebels are making it very clear that this goes far beyond having a um, alliance and access against Iran might do a lot more in the long term against that threat than um, destroying Gaza. So we have these advantages and disadvantages here to weigh. As Jake Sullivan, the National Security Council uh, advisor said, this would solve what was heretofore Israel's biggest concern in terms of security, Iran. With this, it would be suddenly isolated along with its proxies, and it will have to make decisions about what it wants its future to be. Blinken also said, you know, you now have something you didn't have before, and that is Arab countries and Muslim countries, even beyond the region, that are prepared to have a relationship with Israel in terms of its integration, its normalization, its security, that they were never prepared to have before, and to do things, to give the necessary assurance, to make the necessary commitments and guarantees, so Israel is not only integrated, but it could feel secure. So you really have these massive advantages and disadvantages, and I think we'd be doing a disservice to the conversation by trying to minimize the dangers, but also trying to minimize the advantages. There's a lot here. So... Obviously, selling this to Netanyahu is not an option. He's already said no. But could you sell this to the Israeli public? Quite possibly. Um, a new poll came out um, that was commissioned by a pro-peace um, institution, but through a very well-respected polling company. And they said the following. 28.9% of Israelis would oppose this deal. Uh, and 19.8% said they didn't know if they'd 
they support it. But over half, 51.3%, said they would back such an agreement. One of the main reasons uh, being that it would involve the return of the hostages, which has become sort of a national obsession. But then you add a cherry on top of that of Saudi normalization, and that appeals to uh, to a lot of people. Of course, Netanyahu isn't so much worried about general public opinion. He's worried about his base. And the more right-wing people in the country are, of course, absolutely against it. According to this poll, 39% of right-wingers would back it. My guess is that's a little bit high. Uh, but of course, if Netanyahu were to try to sell it to the right wing, that number could be higher. But that doesn't seem to be something um, that he would want to do. But it's something that a future prime minister may be able to do. And if Netanyahu is not going to be in power for long, these numbers might end up being quite consequential. So I think we need to think about, about this more in depth than, than we currently are um, among Israelis. The Hamas attacks on Israel are a symptom of two larger problems. Um, a, in my opinion, the number one is Iranian ambitions in the region. Because without Iran funding them, telling them what to do, uh, they Hamas wouldn't have a viable existence to begin with. And we see that because of the conjunction they have with other Iranian proxies. And B, the lack of a solution to the Palestinian issue, which creates um, a certain amount of desperation and guarantees recruits for, um, for Hamas. The plan for Saudi normalization with a, a Palestinian state actually cleverly tries to deal with both. Now, it's not necessarily optimally designed to deal with both, but it does try, and therefore it's worth engaging with. Should Israel just accept it? No. No, I've already mentioned that there are some weaknesses here. We can take a, a page out of Ariel Sharon's book. Uh, in 2003, Ariel Sharon was given the roadmap from the Bush administration, which was not a bad plan, but he didn't like it. So he um, gave sent it back with 14 reservations from the government. Rather than rejecting it, he said, these are 14 things that we need to change and we need to talk to the Palestinians about. And Israel should do something like that. Say, we accept this plan in principle, but we would have to see these issues addressed successfully for us to be able to move forward with it. So that way, Israel is taking this plan and engaging its needs rather than uh, the United States trying to ram it down Israel's throat, hoping that Netanyahu will be replaced uh, and waiting for a moment of Israeli weakness to do that. That's not good for anyone. It's not good for Israel. It's not good for the United States. Uh, Netanyahu should engage with it in order to improve the deal. But And he knows that, but you know, domestic political concerns being what they are, he probably won't do that. In addition, I think Israel should not be the one to say no. We know the Palestinians have a lot of difficulty uh, engaging with the two-state solution. We know that they often end up rejecting it. Um, by Israel engaging with this, we can force the Palestinians to look at the plan and try to either receive it, which would involve a historical move towards a two-state solution, or to have them say no, and then we can blame them for the failure. But there's really no reason for Israel to take the blame and not to try to shape this deal in accordance with their interests. I see absolutely no advantage to just rejecting this deal. Try to shape it as um, positively as possible. Okay, um, we have um, a bunch of questions. Some of them are quite long, but we love our uh, members and followers who have uh, passionate opinions and a lot to say. So let's start with um, Hario Super or Jario Super. The U.S. appears to be urging Israel to wind down its war against Hamas, consider the day after, not invade Lebanon, and recognize a two-state solution, which is all against Netanyahu's wishes. It sure is. Again, putting aside right or wrongs, do you think this is a strategic mistake by the U.S. that will drive other allies who are watching this carefully into the arms of other large powers like China, Russia, and India? Do you think this may lead other nations being drawn, or at least to split their alliance, um, with Russia and China, who can supply military equipment, but don't interfere or judge their allies as much as the U.S. does? 
So this is a, a, a great question, one that really transcends the, um, the Israeli issue, and it's about American alliance policy. Uh, the United States has always offered a weird alliance package um, where it has more economic resources and has better weapons uh, and opens more doors into, in, into the global trade system, which is the benefit. But the drawback has always been the United States will lecture you on human rights, may intervene in your domestic politics in a way that other countries um, would not. So it has sort of a advantage disadvantage kind of package. Traditionally, that's been enough to draw a lot of allies and a lot of partners. It could be that as U.S. power in the world recedes, that package becomes less and less um, attractive. But I think um, right now, the U.S. still has enough advantages to make an alliance with it seem attractive. Um, and I don't think that's yet reached crisis point. But there's nothing new about this. These debates were exactly the way you phrased it, were being had during the Cold War um, as well. I, you know, during my dissertation, I went over documents from the 60s and 70s, and people were saying the exact same thing. But the U.S. still has its allies. Okay, Fred, close friend of the show, asks, first, with respect to Netanyahu, does he have a reasonable shot at re-election when the war ends? He's probably going to be blamed for the military and security screw-ups that occurred before 10-7, even if he has a legitimate alibi. If this is the case, why doesn't he put politics aside and do the right thing for Israel? And self-deluded that he's convinced he is right about everything. So I think um, Netanyahu is playing for the chance of having a re-election, and I guess there is a chance, but it looks pretty low right now. Um, and that also might be one of the reasons that um, he's trying right now, seems to be kind of thinking about ending the war because he doesn't have an end game. And if he can at least bring the hostages back, then he has some sort of um, achievement. But I don't think that's going to be anywhere near enough. I honestly don't see how Netanyahu re wins re-election. What he'll do is he'll batten the hatches. He'll try to blame the U.S. for trying to create a Palestinian state that will be a base of terrorism, um, which will be to the detriment of Israeli um, diplomacy, and manage to get a good amount of votes, more than he probably has now, by playing a very divisive strategy. But I don't think it'll be enough to win. I think that already during the judicial reform, He'd lost his majority. The problems of um, October 7th have deepened that and perhaps made it permanent. And then there's also people in the Likud who want to remove him in order for them to run and get a few more mandates. So he's playing a pretty good game of trying to stay in power, but it involves blaming the U.S., blaming the IDF, causing a ton of damage. And it's 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 not going to be enough. I don't think he has a reasonable shot at re-election. No. Second question from Fred is about American politics. He says, Bernie Sanders introduced a motion to make aid to Israel subject to an obscure law from 1976 that Israeli enforced, requiring compliance with international law. He also noted that Senate Majority Leader Chuck Schumer is trying to work through a compromise position with the 10 senators who voted for the Sanders motion from the Democratic Party. Is this just Schumer playing lip service to the progressing wing of his caucus, or should supporters of Israel be worried that bipartisan support for Israel is starting to crumble? So the answer to that is yes to both. I think uh, right now, support for Israel among the Democratic Party legislators is actually a little bit stronger than we expected. I think we all have to admit that. It's held up nicely in this war. Part of that is probably because um, Biden is president and they don't want to stab him in the back in an election year. But generally speaking, it's been holding up okay. The people who are against it are the usual suspects, people who are against it before the war as well. Your Rashida Tlaib's, your... Bernie Sanders, you know, um, et cetera. But in the long term, we can tell that there's a problem. Younger voters are, are turning against Israel. Younger voters vote more Democrat. Um, and of course, if Trump was president right now, we would probably see a lot more Democrats um, who would not be supporting Israel. So support for Israel isn't crumbling, but it's not doing very well. And Netanyahu picking fights with um, Biden after picking fights with uh, Obama, especially when Biden has been so pro-Israel, really isn't helping that. 
So in the long term, I think there's there's plenty of reason to for for concern. There's also reason for concern with the Republican Party, I believe, where the uh, extreme right is becoming less pro-Israel and more isolationist. So there's just reason for concern all around. Um, FRDZ4KB asked, for someone with great sympathy for Israel, it's hard to watch how the incompetence of Netanyahu to prosecute this war and create some diplomatic cover is harming Israel. Axios reports that Qatar, the US, Egypt, uh, and one would assume the EU are on board for what is essentially the Egypt plan. And it seems that Hamas is too. Um, but you said on Twitter, time to escalate, not negotiate, because it is a bad deal. Yeah, that's pretty much what I said. I ask you, escalate how? You already flattened Gaza, killed plenty of civilians, and let in the bare minimum aid, even though your allies practically begged you to vis-a-vis the civilians to fucking buy you time and political cover. Netanyahu and the right-wingers were too stupid to understand that. Okay, there's a there's a lot to uh, to unpack here. First of all, I think that Netanyahu knows that the U.S. bought him cover. He's just being very ungrateful for that. As for what I meant by escalate, well, it, it's very simple. I've been saying the same thing here for several weeks now, which is that Israel should go into Rafah, take over Rafah, take over Philadelphia, and control the aid. Right now, it does not control um, how arms are getting in, does not control how aid is getting in, and it's allowing Hamas to govern Gaza from the south. All these things are a mistake. Uh, to some extent, they almost make the entire military operation a waste of time and are one of the reasons the military operation is not working. So I would say fortune favors the bold is the old um, is the old maxim. Israel needs to be bolder in negotiations, but also bolder in its military attacks, not by killing more civilians, mind you, that is good for no one, but by taking over important strategic points and by occupying the entire um, Gaza Strip before it starts negotiating, because then it'll be negotiating from a position of power. So that's my uh, my personal position, uh, which I'm sure you disagree with. Uh, okay, so that is the end of our episode for today. Um, if you like what I do here, consider supporting me on Patreon at Shael Media, and also consider listening to my podcast, History of the Land of Israel, podcast. I will see you here again very soon.